Hello, my name is Roy Simpson, and I'm a professor of mathematics at Cosumnes River College in Sacramento, California. And now today we are going to go ahead and do another proof in differential calculus. And this proof is for limits of composition. Really what we want to talk about is what happens as we take the limit as x approaches a of a function composed with another function. And what does that turn into? The theorem here says that if we have a continuous function that specifically is continuous at some value b, and we happen to know that the limit as x approaches a of another function g of x is equal to that b, then the limit as x approaches a of f of g of x is equal to f of b. Well, this might be easier to see if we go ahead and maybe take a simple uh, example. So here's just a very simple example. Let's find the limit as x approaches 2 of f composed with g, where g happens to equal x squared and f happens to equal x cubed. Well, what that theorem is essentially saying is that as x approaches 2, we're going to look at g of x first and see if this function approaches something that f is continuous at. So uh, the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x is the same thing as saying the limit as x approaches 2 of x cubed, because that's, oops, x squared actually, sorry, g is x squared. So as x approaches 2, uh, we have to know that this, we have a bunch of properties in the past that allow us to say that this is going to be 2 squared, or in other words, 4. Now my question is not what is the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x. The question really was what is the limit as x approaches 2 of f of g of x. So really what's happening is that as x approaches 2, g of x is approaching 4. I just want to make sure that as g of x approaches 4, or in other words, as our input into f here approaches 4, is it okay? Are we going to have any issues with our function? And obviously, in this case, as x approaches 4, f gives no issues at all. So the limit as x approaches 2 of f of g of x is really, it's pretty safe to say it's going to be, sorry, f evaluated at the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x, which we've just found, I'm missing a parenthesis there, which we've just found to be uh, f at uh, 4, 4 cubed is 64. So it's totally fine because <clears throat> that function f is continuous at 4. Totally okay to basically plug that in. So we're just going to prove that this is very safe to do. That's the whole idea behind calculus, is to do a bunch of proofs to make sure that what you're saying is completely okay. The prerequisite knowledge, the things that you have to kind of really know for this proof, you really have to be very familiar with the precise definition of a limit. That's the epsilon delta proofs. We're going to be using that. Uh, also, you have to be pretty familiar with continuity. Remember, continuity uh, is uh, really a more stringent limit than just a limit itself. It's the limit as x approaches a of f of x. So f is continuous at a if this limit is actually equal to f of a. Basically, it's just saying that we could have plugged in a for this limit. Um, and uh, it also means that the limits from the left and the right match f being evaluated at a. And finally, you have to know everything about functions and compositions of functions for this proof to make sense for you. Now, like any good proof, you always start with the assumptions they're allowing you. So in this case, they're only allowing us a few assumptions. We can, we're allowed to assume that f is continuous at b. We're also allowed to, su to assume that the limit as x approaches a of g of x is equal to b. So I'm going to write that at the beginning of my proof here. So I, here I have that written down, suppose f is continuous at x equals b, and that the limit as x approaches a of g of x is actually equal to b. Now it's always a good idea in proofs to have some scratch work that you're working from. So you do a lot of scratch work first, and then write a very clean proof. So what I'm going to do is write my scratch work 
off to the right hand side so that you can see what my ideas are and where I want to head and then I'll fill in whatever I can uh, as I, I get a better idea how the proof should go. So here I have it deline delineated that I have my scratch work off on the right here uh, and let's think about what we want to show here. We're going to want to show that the limit as x approaches a of this function is going to equal f of b. And when you want to do a proof in calculus, especially a limit proof, you really need to do the um, precise definition of a limit. So we are going to uh, assume that somebody hands us an epsilon, and uh, we are going to say that if x, the distance between x and a is less than some delta, then the distance between the function and the limit should be less than that given epsilon. So that, remember, is part of our prerequisite knowledge. You should know epsilon delta proofs. So let's go ahead and write that we want to know that in our scratch work. So let me explain what I've written here. Uh, so somebody's handed us an epsilon, a positive epsilon, and we're just going to find a positive delta so that when the distance between x and a is less than delta, that will imply that the distance between our function and our limit should be less than epsilon. This is straight from the definition of a limit, the precise definition of a limit. So whenever, like I said, whenever you're doing a limit proof, you always have to reach back to this precise definition of a limit. Now at this point, most people will probably stare at this for a little bit and try to figure things out. This is where I'm going to, because this is what we want to find. So now I have to start working with what they've given me. And they've given me something very important here. They've given me the fact that f is continuous at b. So f is continuous at b. And I wrote down x equals b, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to write y equals b. And there's a reason why. And that reason is because what we're essentially plugging into f is the outputs, or are the outputs, of g. Remember, our original proof, we want to plug the outputs from g into f. And often, when I have an output of, from a function, I think of that as a y value. So I'm just going to go ahead and in this proof, just for ease of argument's sake, just say that we're going to plug some variable in to f and that that what we're plugging is just the outputs of g and we'll just call those the y's okay it's not that big of a deal really so i'm going to start my little notes over here about this f is continuous implies and by the way because it's my scratch scratch work i'm just shorthanding my notation here okay but f is continuous implies that the limit as an output from g approaches b of f of y should equal f of b. And this is straight from, again, the definition of continuity, which is our prerequisite knowledge. I just replaced the letter x here with the letter y and the letter a with the letter b, but that's the only difference. So what does that give us? Well, let's go ahead and stare at this for a little bit and see if we can find out what this will yield for us. So the continuity on uh, of f is uh, at b is going to be super important. So um, let's see. Well, if this limit is equal to f of b, we can say then that there's got to be uh, some delta, uh, but we've already used the letter delta, unfortunately. So um, for this function, for this limit, there's got to be just a different delta. There might be a totally different delta. Um, so that when y, the distance between y and b is less than that delta, the distance between f of y and f of b has to be less than this epsilon as well. So I'll go ahead, I'll go ahead and write that down in a little symbolic notation. That means there is, if you don't know symbolic uh, notation in mathematics, backwards capital E means there is. So there is a delta, but I didn't use the delta we already have in use, I used a different delta. But there's a, some delta that's positive so that, and I'll use this symbol, this means such that. Uh, let's see, the distance between y in this case, uh, that's a horrible looking y, so I'll rewrite that y. Distance between y and b being less than that delta should imply that the distance between f of y and f of b is less than our given epsilon. 
So again, somebody handed us an epsilon in the beginning of the problem. And I'm just saying, well, because this limit exists, that's part of the, our assumption. We're allowed to assume that because f is continuous at b, we're allowed to assume that that limit exists. So therefore, there's got to be a delta 1 so that this statement right here is true. That's perfectly fine. Now, I told you that we already used this delta. Technically, we haven't used that delta. We want to find that delta. So I just used the letter delta sub 1 here because this is not ultimately going to be my delta in this proof. Let's see, is there anything else I could possibly say about the continuity? Uh, not really. Let's see if we can use the other thing that we were given. We were also given that... Uh, and I'll use a kind of a different highlighting color. We're given that the limit as x approaches a of g of x is equal to b. Oh, well, that's kind of nice. We've been given a, another limit existence. So that means that uh, we can have another precise definition here. And actually, you know what I'm going to do? I for Because I know what's kind of coming up, I'm going to go ahead and pretend that this is epsilon sub 1. I'm just going to say that somebody gave us an epsilon. Don't worry. We'll, I'll, I'll rectify that in a moment, but this will allow me to kind of talk to you about um, my choices for lettering here. So that blue highlighting bit, and I'll use blue to kind of write my logic here. Um, so let's see, the blue, I'll just write it this way, the limit as x approaches a of g of x equals b implies, totally implies, that there exists uh, a, ooh, let's say delta sub 2, greater than zero, such that as long as the distance between uh, x and a is less than that delta sub 2, uh, it'll mean that um, the distance between g of x and b is less than some epsilon. So notice I'm just keeping with the notation. Uh, I have a secondary limit, so I have delta 2s and epsilon 2. Now here's where we have to do some thinking. Let's see. Notice that I want, go back to what we want. We want to find a delta greater than 0 so that when the distance between x and a is less than delta, it would imply the distance between f of g of x and f of b is less than epsilon. Notice that I have the distance between x and a right here. Okay, so that is going to really help us out. And unfortunately, that implication only gives us that, g, that the distance between g of x and b is less than some number. Oh, that sucks. But wait a second. What if I were to say that, what if we were to let y equal g of x? then this is g of x minus b being less than epsilon is the same thing as saying the distance between y and b is less than oh, this epsilon over 2. So I'll just set this to equal my epsilon over 2. And let's see, which would then imply that f of y, which by the way is f of, because we let y equal g of x, so that's f of g of x, uh, minus f of b is going to be less than epsilon sub 1. Aha! So this will let epsilon sub 1 be our regular old epsilon. Okay, so let's go ahead and now form up the proof, because this was a lot of my scratch work. It's real messy, um, but this is kind of how you have to think to get a, a proof, an accurate proof done. So when I go ahead and write the rest of my proof on the left-hand side here, I'm going to use the proper notation that I've kind of pointed at and replaced uh, in this scratch work. You'll see what I'm talking about when we get there. So our proof goes, again, since f is continuous at b, the limit as y approaches b of f of y is equal to b. And so for any given epsilon greater than 0, this is the epsilon we're hinging our entire proof on, any epsilon greater than 0, there must exist some number that's positive such that the distance between y and b is less than delta and 1 implies that the distance between the function evaluated at y and the function evaluated at b, which reminds me that I miswrote part of my proof there. That should have been the limit as y approaches b of f of y equals f of b. Sorry, that was because it was continuous. Anyway, the distance between the function and the limit should be less than epsilon. Okay.
So again, this is really following our scratch work on the side. I had just on the side had noted kind of what's going to happen. Moreover, since the limit as x approaches a of g of x is equal to b for a given positive number, I should probably have written positive in there, but we'll just say for a given number, in this case, say, uh, oh, let's just go ahead and say, hmm, delta 1. Okay, so that very same delta 1, okay, which happens to be positive in this case. There exists a positive delta. This is going to be our delta in our de epsilon delta, such that the difference between x and a being less than delta will completely imply g of x, the distance between g of x and b, is less than that delta 1. Letting y equal g of x implies that the absolute value of f of g of x minus f of b is less than epsilon. Now, I just want to convince you of that. If you look at this, I'm going to erase this in a moment, but if you look at that y, if we let y equal g of x, remember, we now, if we let y equal g of x, we know that g of x minus b is less than delta 1. If you let y equal g of x, that means g of x minus b is less than delta 1, which tells us that f of g of x minus f of b is less than epsilon. That's exactly what we want. Thus, and I'll write this down, I didn't have room on my page so I had to kind of scroll down a little bit, but thus the limit as x approaches b of f of g of x is equal to f of b, right? Because we are saying the diff distance between x and b, actually I meant x approaches a, I just realized that as I was reading it out loud I thought there's something wrong with that. Anyway, the limit as x approaches a of f of g of x is equal to f of b. And again, if you just look up, you can see that the distance between x and a is less than delta, which implies that the distance between g of x and b is less than delta 1. But remember, g of x is y, so the distance between y and b is less than delta 1. That implies the distance between f of g of x minus, and f of b is less than epsilon. That is the epsilon delta proof. It's a very tough proof as proofs go. Um, well, it's not a very tough proof. It's just a proof that you that is probably difficult early on in calculus. But that is how that proof is done. Yeah.